Hello, my friends. This is Dr. Beter. Today is December 22, 1977, and this is my AUDIO LETTER No. 29. Three days from now will be Christmas Sunday, 1977. On that day my family and I will join millions of others around the world in celebrating the birth of our Lord Jesus Christ. Like other proud parents, I look forward especially to watching my three small children as they open their gifts. For them, Christmas is a time of pure joy, and that helps to make it so for us grown-ups as well. Even so, this Christmas they will not be receiving the one present I wish they could have most of all, the gift of a future to look forward to, a future of freedom instead of slavery, a future of plenty instead of scarcity, a future of real peace instead of deliberate war. If I had the power to grant my children an abundant future of freedom and peace all by myself, I'd do it. But that is not possible. They cannot look forward to a future like that unless all of our children can do the same. And, my friends, the future which we as a nation are bequeathing to our trusting children is one for which we deserve to be chastised severely by our Lord. Much has been entrusted to us, and we have not measured up to that trust. We in America have always looked back at the tragedy at Nazi Germany became and said to ourselves, How could such a thing have happened? Couldn't the German people see that they were headed toward disaster? Why didn't they do something to stop it? But apparently we as a nation learned nothing at all from their example or from any of the other lessons in history. Because, my friends, the United States is headed for a disaster that dwarfs what happened to Germany or Japan or Russia or China. It is about us that future generations will say, how could such a thing have happened? Couldn't the American people see that they were headed toward disaster? Why didn't they do something to stop it? More and more Americans can sense now that something is definitely wrong. If nothing else, our survival instinct is ringing a muffled alarm inside all of us, warning of imminent danger. But so far most Americans are still on the sidelines, forfeiting all our rights and failing our responsibilities under the United States Constitution. Instead of analyzing the facts that are already before us, most of us choose the false wisdom called wait and see. Instead of going to the effort to challenge our rulers about matters that are deciding our fate, we deceive ourselves with the notion that at the next election we can discharge our whole duty by casting a vote. Meanwhile we just sat on the fence while we wait and see. Those who are waiting to see do not have much longer to wait. At the beginning of this year in AUDIO LETTER No. 20 I pointed out that we are in the period of undeclared warfare that history will record as pre-war leading up to the planned Nuclear War I. Today as 1977 is on the wane, the pre-war period is also on the wane. The first stages of war itself are intended to erupt soon, beginning in the Middle East. When I resume recording the AUDIO LETTER in August of this year, after a silence of three months, I warned you that we are now in a new phase as we watch increasingly the fulfillment of man-made plans for disaster and war. Having squandered and wasted the days of grace God gave us to prevent disaster, we as a nation are going to suffer by our own choice. My three topics for today are Topic No. 1, Cyclones, Airquakes, and Soviet Intimidation of America. Topic No. 2, The Dismantling 
of the NATO alliance. And Topic No. 3, America's Betrayal into a New Bolshevik Revolution. Topic No. 1. Last month I told you the locations of the Soviet Particle Beam Weapon installations that are now operational on the moon, and I warned you that, quote, if the normal Soviet pattern is followed, we can expect a test of a moon-based Particle Beam weapon against some Earth target in the very near future. If this is done, it will probably take place under circumstances where its effects can be explained away as having some other cause." Unquote. Events are now moving very fast, my friends. When I recorded those words last month on November 21, the first Soviet test shot at the Earth had already taken place, but intelligence about it had not yet reached me. The perfect opportunity for Soviet purposes was provided by a huge cyclone in the Bay of Bengal as it approached the southeast coast of India. Soviet cosmonauts at two of the Particle Beam installations on the moon readied their weapons and waited for the angry storm to reach the best possible position for the test. This occurred on the evening of November 19, 1977, as the cyclone was lashing the coastline of the Indian state of Andhra Pradesh. As millions of Indians were struggling against the powerful winds and driving rain of the cyclone, two Soviet Particle Beam weapons a quarter million miles away silently swung around to point in their direction. The weapons were aimed at two nearby locations at sea within the storm. To avoid any chance that the beams might interfere with one another on the way to the target, they were not fired simultaneously but in quick succession. Traveling at virtually the speed of light, each beam reached the Earth in less than two seconds. As I told you in AUDIO LETTER No. 26, a charged particle beam rips apart the atoms of anything it strikes, causing it to explode. That's why, as I said then, it's an all-weather weapon. It blasts its way through air, cloud, water, armor plate, and anything else it strikes. When each beam aimed at the cyclone reached its target, it produced a brilliant air flash and a tremendous explosion at the water surface. A portion of the water itself was made to explode by the beam, creating a localized artificial tidal wave. The result, as described by victims who lived through it, was broadcast over the BBC on December 13 earlier this month. A relief worker who had just returned from the scene described what she called complete devastation along the coastal area. Everything, including even strongly built houses, had been flattened, and the loss of life was staggering. And what had transformed a bad storm into a total disaster, my friends, was a single tidal wave that suddenly swept ashore in the midst of the storm. I now quote the exact words of the British relief worker as she described what eyewitnesses had told her, quote, There were two enormous blinding flashes, and the whole sky lighted up as though on fire. Then this vast tidal wave, about 30 miles in length along the coast and 18 feet high, just bore down upon them." Unquote. My friends, a tidal wave is not a normal part of a cyclone. High waters, yes. Flooding, yes. And normal wind-driven waves, yes, but not tidal waves. And yet, if you will study the news reports from all sources, you will discover that a single devastating tidal wave was reported consistently. Eyewitnesses describe it as something that came suddenly, sweeping away everything in its path, including loved ones. And it caused devastation inland to unheard of distances where people have never had reason to fear cyclones before. For example, a ferry boatman in the village of Panumudi is quoted in the New York Times for December 12 as saying, quote, 
all my life I have never been frightened so much. We are twenty miles from the sea, and yet the wave came all the way to destroy our boats and our living." Unquote. With at least 10,000 dead, over 2,500 villages destroyed, and 2 million homeless, it's no wonder that this cyclone is rated as the worst to hit India in more than a century. From the Soviet viewpoint, the test was a complete success. The ability of their lunar-based charged particle beams to blast an Earth target with devastating force has been confirmed, and by carrying out their test in the midst of a violent cyclone, they succeeded in camouflaging the man-made disaster by combining it with a natural one. Both the lunar and earth orbital particle beam weapons of the Soviet Union must now be regarded as fully operational and tested, but the lunar particle beam test was scarcely completed before tests began with yet another secret Soviet weapon. Last month I reminded you of the lightning pace of weapons advancement that was still publicly visible up until the early 1960s, but at the secret level military technology was advancing even faster. As early as 1962, top military officers were seriously worried about a future threat to America that was then already visible on the technical horizon. This threatened future development consisted of space platforms capable of levitating in stationary positions over our major cities or other strategic locations. These platforms would not be in orbit like normal Earth satellites. Instead, they would actually hover for long periods of time over a single spot. This cannot be done with orbiting satellites except for those stationed over the Earth's equator about 22,000 miles out in space. So the United States already had the capability long ago to build these hovering platforms if desired, manning them with 40-man crews who would remain aboard for two months at a time. Therefore it was obvious that someday the Soviet Union would also develop this capability, and our military leaders wanted to be in a position to interdict any Soviet platforms that might someday invade the space over our country, but their urgent pleas for authority and funds to develop a defense against the expected threat of floating platforms were rudely turned aside. They didn't fit in with the two-pronged program for world military domination that I explained for you last month. On the surface, America was to be gradually stripped of its known weaponry, while in total secrecy the Moon program was to provide America's secret rulers with the unadmitted ability to destroy the Soviet Union in a final double-cross. Now it's fifteen years later. The grand design of our secret rulers lies in ruins, shattered less than three months ago by Russia's upset victory in the Battle of the Harvest Moon on September 27. The men and women of America's secret moon colony in Copernicus Crater lie entombed where they died, bombarded by a Soviet neutron particle beam weapon orbiting the Earth. And now the Soviet Union controls the moon, and from it the Earth. Furthermore, spurred on by the danger of losing the decisive particle beam race, the Kremlin has spent fantastic amounts of money to develop a bewildering array of military weapons of every type. Wherever possible, they have borrowed and exploited whole technologies developed in the West at our cost. They have bought critical hardware to fill gaps in their own technology, paying for it with United States financed loans guaranteed by American taxpayers. They have contracted for Western multinational corporations to build whole manufacturing facilities in Russia, factories that are unparalleled here at home, and, relieved of the need to develop so many things for themselves, they have been able to concentrate on advanced projects 
that leapfrog ahead of our own technology in certain areas. And one of these areas is the hovering space platform, which certain of our military leaders were worried about 15 years ago. For many years the Soviet Union has led the world in the field of high-energy physics and in many areas of advanced mathematics as well. This enabled them to win the race for the Particle Beam Weapon, and has also enabled them to develop a hovering space platform design that operates on more advanced principles than those our military anticipated 15 years ago. The Soviet hovering platform concept is built around a branch of physics most people have never even heard of called electrogravitics. At the present time, the Soviet Union is using electrogravitic vehicles both on the moon and in space close to Earth. Theoretically, these vehicles will someday be able to travel directly between Earth and the moon and even over interplanetary distances, but the transition from the gravitational field of the Earth to that of the moon, among other things, is potentially hazardous, so this is not being done yet. Instead. Rockets are being used by Soviet cosmonauts to travel between the Earth and the Moon, but the electrogravitic levitation is being used on the Moon itself. The electrogravitic vehicles developed so far by the Soviet Union are still very crude. They can lift themselves vertically up or down using the levitation field they produce, but have to use small rocket motors to move sideways. But crude or not, the Soviet Union now has these hovering space platforms, and we do not, nor do we have any means of combating them, since our secret masters have refused ever since 1962 to allow any means of defense to be developed. I can now reveal that the Kremlin has begun deploying hovering space platforms over the United States and elsewhere armed with Particle Beam weapons. At this moment seven Soviet hovering space platforms are already on station over North America and the waters nearby. Platform No. 1 is hovering 672 miles above a spot in the Atlantic Ocean, about 170 miles east of Charleston, South Carolina. No. 2 is 821 miles above a spot in the Pacific. 256 miles southwest of Los Angeles, California. No. 3 is floating 784 miles above a spot about 42 miles west of the so-called Four Corners of Utah, Colorado, Arizona, and New Mexico. No. 4 is 821 miles directly above the intersection of the borders of Idaho, Montana, and Canada. No. 5 is hovering 597 miles above a spot that is about 50 miles east northeast of Denver, Colorado. No. 6 is 560 miles above Illinois, over a spot about 80 miles southwest of Chicago and 50 miles east of Peoria. No. 7 is at the same altitude, 560 miles, over a spot about 10 miles northwest of Morgantown, West Virginia, at the border of southwest Pennsylvania. The first four platforms are manned. The other three, launched more recently, are still being checked out by remote control prior to being manned by crews who will be carried there by Electrogravitic Shuttle. Early this month, on December 2, 1977, the crew of Soviet Platform No. 1 received the orders they had been waiting for from Moscow. They were to commence defocused beam tests. A defocused beam expands out over a broader and broader area as it flashes through space, and as a result, when the broad beam strikes the atmosphere, most of the energy is spent in the air itself. This is the exact opposite of the situation on November 19 when the lunar particle beams created tight shafts of energy that passed through the Indian Cyclone to strike the sea with great power. The crew adjusted their Particle Beam weapon to defocus the beam to a prescribed amount. Then at approximately 10 a.m. they aimed their weapon at a spot in the sea about 50 miles off the South Carolina coast and fired. The air itself over the ocean east of South Carolina was made to explode with the force of 100 tons of TNT. 
along the South Carolina coast, thousands of people heard the tremendous rumble from the blast at sea. Dishes rattled and some windows broke. At the Lamont Doherty Geological Laboratory north of New York City, acoustic monitoring instruments jumped off scale. Everyone who heard it wondered what had happened. About 3.45 that afternoon, the crew of Platform 1 were ready for a second test shot. The target area this time was the sea off the New Jersey coast, 650 miles to the north-northeast of Platform 1. The Particle Beam weapon had been readjusted to compensate for the greater distance involved, and then it was fired. At points along the coast from Cape May, New Jersey to Connecticut, thousands heard the powerful blast as more dishes rattled and more windows broke. Again acoustic monitors were driven off scale. On December 15 Platform 1 began firing again. At least five blasts were fired into the air over the Atlantic that day. On December 20, just two days ago, still more blasts took place. But the major news media have begun to treat the whole matter as if it were a joke. Most Americans do not live on the East Coast, of course, and have not heard these explosions for themselves. But listen to these words that a housewife in Manhattan used to describe one of the explosions to me. It was a bright sunny day, and my older kids were in school. I was at home when suddenly there was a tremendous, tremendous boom. It sounded like it could have been next door, or it could have been a million miles away. You just couldn't tell. It was a low, thundering, deep, all-encompassing noise. It sounded like a bomb, but I thought it might be an earthquake. I grabbed the kids, my younger kids who were at home, and ran to the wall. I glanced at the clock and it was just after 1 o'clock. I waited to see what else would happen, but nothing did. I turned on the radio to find out what had happened, but there was nothing on the radio, nothing about what had happened. The kids in school were all scared. The teachers said, It's Con Edison! But of course if it had been Con Edison, the whole neighborhood would have blown up. It just sounded as if something had hit the bottom of the earth." Unquote. Soviet acts of intimidation are becoming more frequent and more vicious. Only last night around 7 p.m. another series of so-called mystery explosions were heard off the East Coast. And only today two grain elevators, one in Louisiana, the other in Mississippi, exploded within hours of one another. The first explosion took place this morning, December 22, at the huge Continental Grain Company elevator on the west bank of the Mississippi River, a few miles upstream from downtown New Orleans. Eyewitnesses said, quote, It went up like an H-bomb. The ground shook for several seconds as though in an earthquake. A huge mushroom cloud stretched perhaps a mile into the air and debris from the structure kept falling like feathers into the river. The entire facility, storing $100 million worth of grain, was ruined, and there were scores injured, perhaps two dozen killed. The portion of the elevator nearest the river was completely blown off. My friends, when I resumed recording my AUDIO LETTER last August with Issue No. 25, I warned that there were 158 Soviet nuclear mines, that is, small H-bombs, buried underwater along the Mississippi River. The destruction of the grain elevator near New Orleans this morning resulted from the detonation of the first of these bombs, which was located in the river near the south end of the loading dock. Other Soviet nuclear mines are still waiting to be exploded within a few miles of that location. One is just across the river from the site of today's explosion in an area known as Carrollton Bend. Another is about a mile in the upstream direction from the ruined grain elevator under the southeast end of the Huey P. Long Bridge. Looking downstream, another Soviet nuclear mine is lurking in the water beneath the Greater New Orleans Bridge. Further downstream there is one at the entrance to Chalmette Ship Wharf No. 2. 
There are two in the Inner Harbor Navigation Canal, one just north of the lock and another about three-quarters of a mile north of that. And not only is the river mined, for example, there is a nuclear mine in Lake Pontchartrain near the south end of the Pontchartrain Causeway. It has now been four months since I revealed the situation in the Mississippi River. Since that time I have never been contacted by a single official having jurisdiction of any kind along the Mississippi River to find out more about the situation. No one has made the slightest effort to take action and now many have lost their lives and many more are injured. About two hours later the second grain elevator suddenly exploded in Tupelo, Mississippi. Like the first, it was destroyed by a Soviet nuclear mine, but Tupelo is not on a river, and the mine was buried in the ground nearby. Having first sabotaged America's water resources, then important governmental and military sites, the Soviet agents are still crisscrossing our land unhampered and far advanced in sabotaging our food warehousing facilities. Major grain elevators throughout the Midwest, the Great Plains, and other grain producing areas have been mined already like the one that exploded today at Tupelo, Mississippi. My friends, how long will we continue to just wait and see? How many will die before the rest of us open our eyes to the truth as it really is? Will it go on this way until the day destitute survivors of NUCLEAR WAR ONE are picking their way through the smoking ruins of America with 160 million dead? Topic No. 2 Last May in AUDIO LETTER No. 24 I quoted at length from the warnings of General George Keegan, who retired at the beginning of this year as the Chief of Air Force Intelligence. General Keegan is as great a patriot as he is an intelligence analyst, and it was he who first warned America that Russia was developing the awesome Particle Beam weapon. Earlier this month, on December 14, General Keegan was interviewed on the Bob Snyder Radio Show, Station WDCL in Clearwater, Florida. General Keegan described the bleak military picture we now confront in graphic terms. As his final question to General Keegan, Bob Snyder asked General Keegan, quote, You already said that the Russians could possibly capture Europe in 36 hours. If war broke out between the United States and Russia, I said if, who would win? General Keegan's answer was, and I quote, There is no question in my mind that the Soviet Union would win." Unquote. For more information about General Keegan's comments, I strongly suggest that you write to Mr. Snyder directly. He publishes a very timely and informative newsletter, and you can write to him at the Bob Snyder Newsletter. Box 15, Safety Harbor, Florida, ZIP 33572. For those who are willing to open their eyes and see, more and more bits of the truth are surfacing here and there that point to our true situation. But so far only one major newspaper, the Chicago Tribune, has seen fit to do an in-depth job of alerting its readers to the possible magnitude of the silent war that is already going on. When I revealed the Soviet underwater missile crisis of 1976 during July and August of that year, I alerted you to the major emphasis that the Soviet Union now puts on its Navy. And in a Sunday edition earlier this month, the Chicago Tribune ran a series of articles in a special report section entitled Undersea Warfare. Originally the articles were to have run over a period of days beginning on December 7, the anniversary of Pearl Harbor, but rather than run the risk of being pressured to halt the series after it began, 
The Tribune had the courage to run them all at once on Sunday, December 4, 1977. I strongly recommend that you go to your library and read the Chicago Tribune articles on undersea warfare in their entirety, and read them closely, my friends. To give you some idea of what you'll find, I'll now quote some passages from the various articles, including both the Special Reports section and the lead article which appeared on page 1. Quote, the cold, dark war under seas is an expensive and essential element of Allied military planning at all levels. Occasionally its muffled sounds will reach the ears of the public, but not often. The underseas war is rigged for silent running." Unquote. Unquote. The reason the ASW anti-submarine warfare programs are cloaked in so much secrecy officials said, is that defending the sea has become the weakest link in the chain of American preparation for both conventional and nuclear war." Unquote. Two paragraphs later, quote, The high stakes involved have also produced a continuing mini-war on and below the high seas as ships, submarines, and planes of the United States and its allies fenced with Soviet forces testing each other's systems. One arena for these so far bloodless encounters is the North Atlantic, where the United States has positioned its most effective ASW forces and equipment." Unquote. Later in the same article, quote, But it was learned that the system is far from completely effective. Frequently United States hunters lose Soviet submarines after tracking them for a while. As a result, the United States Command is confident it knows how many Soviet submarines are at sea, but little confidence about their whereabouts." Unquote. I might mention, my friends, that two and a half years ago, in May 1975, Admiral Gorshkov, the head of the Soviet Navy, declared that the Soviet Union has solved the problem of tracking and neutralizing our submarines. In September 1976 I revealed that a Soviet missile planting mini-submarine had become trapped in Chesapeake Bay due to a mechanical malfunction. I urged that it be captured by the United States Navy and the incident used to expose to the whole world the Soviet preparations for surprise nuclear attack. But as I reported the following month in AUDIO LETTER No. 17, President Gerald Ford knuckled under to Soviet demands in the Red Friday Agreement of October 1, 1976, and the Soviet Navy was allowed to enter Chesapeake Bay under cover of night to retrieve the mini-sub whose crew had died by then. The very idea that a Soviet submarine could penetrate so deeply into American territorial waters struck some of my listeners as incredible at the time, and the idea that we would let them get away with it may have seemed even more far-fetched to those who do not understand what is really going on behind the scenes. But listen now to quotations from the Chicago Tribune, page 1 lead story about undersea warfare by Jim Coates and Jack Fuller. The headline is, United States Soviet Subs Prowling Dangerous Waters. Quote, United States spy submarines have been penetrating Soviet territorial waters for the last 30 months despite a widespread belief inside the government that the controversial maneuvers had stopped, sources have told the Tribune." Unquote. Two paragraphs later, after citing Holy Stone as the code name for the program, quote, on one occasion before the 1975 disclosures, the Tribune learned a United States spy submarine was temporarily grounded beneath the busy port of Vladivostok. Holy Stone critics attempted to demonstrate the seriousness of the penetrations by speculating what American reaction would be if a Soviet submarine were discovered aground in San Diego Harbor. While few details were available about the Vladivostok incident, 
Sources said it apparently occurred when the vessel was running on low power to avoid detection and struck the harbor bottom." Unquote. Further on, quote, Intelligence insiders said that the Russians have known about the United States missions for years, even when they were carried out under tight security. Because the Soviets have never publicly complained about the U.S. undersea forays, some analysts have suggested that a similar Russian probing of American sea space is underway." Unquote. And one more quotation. Several former government officials agreed to shed light on the silent battles under the seas. Some said they were willing to speak in an effort to illustrate the dangers of the current situation." Unquote. My friends, the undersea bombs and missiles I've told you about now for well over a year multiply these dangers many times over. So do their close relatives the underwater mines that are now planted all around the United States as well as in other countries. But what makes them most deadly is the failure to take counteractive measures. It's now been proven that undersea missiles and bombs, as well as underwater nuclear mines planted near our dams, can be located and removed given the proper equipment and the will to use it. Last month I warned that the Kensico Reservoir, Terrytown Reservoir, and Pocantico Lake north of New York City all contain Soviet nuclear mines, as did the Hudson River near the east end of the Tappan Zee Bridge. On December 7, I received an important call from an official of Westchester County. It was only the first call, but for once someone was taking the threat seriously. Within days action was quietly being taken to find and remove the bombs in the three bodies of water, and by late last week I received word that all three had been successfully located and removed. Meanwhile, the so-called Federal Dam Inspection Program has suddenly shifted into high gear, providing a perfect opportunity for the Army Corps of Engineers to find and remove many more nuclear mines nationwide. So far I can only confirm that Westchester County, the home of the Rockefellers, has benefited from such quick action. As for the undersea cobalt bombs that now dot the ocean floor worldwide, the Union of South Africa has become the first nation to take action. In late September I informed the Government through intermediaries of the locations of ten Soviet cobalt bombs planted off the South African coast. They were planted along the coast from a point about 200 miles northwest of Cape Town, around the Cape of Good Hope, and around to the east to a point about 160 miles east northeast of Durban. I also relayed the locations of two bombs within South Africa, one near Johannesburg the other close to Kimberley. The South African Government is taking measures to remove these bombs, and so far four bombs from Cape Town to Port Elizabeth have been found and removed. That's the good news, my friends, but the bad news is that nowhere is the public being let in on what is happening. As a result, it's only a matter of time until Soviet agents secretly replace the bombs that have been secretly removed from the two reservoirs and the lake in Westchester County, just as the Soviet Navy has always replaced undersea missiles wherever they were picked up. By the same token, bombs secretly removed by South Africa will eventually be replaced. The end of all this secret jockeying is demonstrated by the current plight of the United States, and now Great Britain as well. Over a year ago the United States Navy was forced to cease and desist from removing each round of Soviet undersea missiles from our territorial waters as they were planted. Now over 200 short-range Soviet nuclear missiles infest our territorial waters, including over 50 in the Great Lakes. Great Britain held out for a full year longer than the United States, but she too has finally succumbed. For a year and more the Royal Navy kept locating and extracting Soviet undersea missiles from her own waters, 
but this fact unfortunately was never made public officially. America's disastrous loss of the space battle of the Harvest Moon in late September rendered the situation untenable, and in early October British Foreign Minister David Owen went to Moscow to capitulate, and now as a result the British Isles are surrounded by no fewer than 60 Soviet underwater missiles, 52 around England, Wales, and Scotland, and 8 around Ireland. As in August 1976, Great Britain is once again more densely targeted by Soviet undersea missiles than any other spot on Earth, and Britain the only other power to join the United States and the Soviet Union in the so-called SALT talks is now joining the United States in the process of surrender through disarmament. The badly weakened NATO alliance is now in the process of being neutralized and dismantled completely. For years the growing might of the Warsaw Pact nations has been tipping the military balance in Europe ever more heavily against NATO, but the process that is now splitting and destroying NATO is not the Warsaw Pact threat. The coup de grace is being delivered by the controlled Carter Administration, obediently doing as it is told by the Soviet Union. The Carter Administration is abandoning NATO, and the Europeans know it. Very much the same process had been planned anyway under the Rockefeller Grand Design that I've detailed for you in the past, but now since the Rockefeller plans unraveled in late September, the Soviet Union is in control, and like a judo throw that enables a person to use his opponent's strength to defeat him, the Soviet Union is now using the Rockefeller Brothers' own machinations against them. NATO badly needs the ground launch cruise missile in order to offset the sheer numerical superiority of Warsaw Pact forces. Originally the cruise missile was intended to be what is called a theater weapon, whether used in the air, on the ground, or at sea. For that purpose the cruise missile would be very useful. But in order to provide an excuse for the scrapping of the B-1 bomber, a true strategic weapon system, the image of the cruise missile was upgraded to that of a fearsome new strategic weapon, which it is not. And now the range of the cruise missile is being restricted in the SALT talks so as to cripple its effectiveness. Our NATO allies are watching helplessly as the Carter Administration bargains away their dwindling hopes for continued survival. The same is true of the neutron bomb, which has been given an image that makes it very hard for European politicians to defend to its public yet NATO military planners see it as the only effective way to erase the ability of the Warsaw Pact to roll over their countries and conquer them in a blitzkrieg. The massive armored might of the Warsaw Pact forces would be neutralized by the neutron bomb because the radiation it produces would penetrate the armor plate and incapacitate or kill the crews inside, and they would not lay waste their own country in the process of defending them if the two neutron bombs were used, but Radio Moscow hammers away every day against the neutron bomb, and the Carter Administration is now throwing away the right to give NATO the neutron bomb in the SALT talks. Meanwhile the security of Western Europe grows more precarious by the day. Certain forces within the CIA have already lit the fuse that is intended to make the Middle East explode into war by programming President Sadat of Egypt to seek a separate peace with Israel. At the same time, reports have reached the West of a rare conference in Moscow of the Soviet Union's top military leaders in Europe, the Far East and around the Soviet frontiers. The entire purpose of the conference was to alert all Soviet forces to be on continuous alert to go to war at a moment's notice. Events are moving steadily forward to the stage of the horrendous act of terrorism which I warned last March, which will throw all three major religions into turmoil while triggering a war. 
Consider these words of Israeli Prime Minister Begin on Sunday, December 18, just a few days ago. Appearing on the CBS program Face the Nation, Begin said, and I quote, If we reach an agreement, as I hope we shall, then I would suggest that President Carter invites both President Sadat and myself to come to Washington, and then we shall be, let me say, a cycle of friendship and faith a Christian President, a Moslem leader, and the Jewish Prime Minister, and announce to the world, Peace unto you." Unquote. When war comes in the Middle East, the Soviet Union now plans to pick up all the pieces, yet leave the United States to receive the blame of world opinion for helping bring about the war. The Carter Administration is not master of its own house and has now been drawn into the position of being a party to the separate peace negotiations that are leading to war. Radio Moscow, meanwhile, is speaking out continually against the treachery that has divided the Arab world as never before. When the Middle East war comes, it will cripple the heart of Europe, which depends on the Middle East for most of its oil. It will be the final straw for Western Europe which will fall into Russia's hands like a ripe plum, either by military invasion or by going the way of Finland and tacitly joining the Soviet sphere of influence. Southern Africa will be dealt a mortal blow as well, cut off from European supplies and support, and 90 percent of its oil from Iran. And the Middle East itself, thanks to the unceasing Soviet denunciations of what is happening now, will slip back under more complete Soviet domination than ever before. It will be another Vietnam for the United States, only far worse. NATO will be no more, and after expending American lives and losing billions in military hardware, America's only reward will be the fruits of a cut-off of oil from the Middle East. Manipulation of the resulting shortages will make them seem far worse than they really are, and emergency economic controls will be imposed by our outlaw government to grind us all down under ever more complete control. My friends, the situation is grave. The only significant reservoir of patriotism and loyalty to America that still exists at the top levels of our government is in the ranks of the military. In the Soviet underwater missile crisis of 1976, it was the Joint Chiefs of Staff, not Congress and not the President, who were responsible for preventing a nuclear Pearl Harbor attack on America. General George S. Brown, the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs, took action only within the constraints of law, but it was he who argued mightily and successfully for President Ford to overrule Henry Kissinger and give the order for the Soviet missiles to be removed. The Kremlin can smell the scent of victory and does not intend to be tripped up again, so the Carter Administration has been ordered by Russia to dismantle the Joint Chiefs of Staff by making drastic changes that will destroy its effectiveness. Preparations to do this are now underway, and already articles critical of the Joint Chiefs are appearing in order to prepare the public to accept any such change without giving it a second thought. If anything at all is to be done to arrest the headlong tumble of our country into disaster, it will have to include superb strategy and expert coordination of our weakened military forces. Once the Joint Chiefs of Staff structure is gone, that chance will be gone with it, but unless the wait-and-see attitude of many Americans changes very quickly, the Joint Chiefs of Staff are finished. Topic No. 3 My friends, recently I have challenged the four Rockefeller brothers, now that their grand plan has been upset by the Soviet Union, to turn over a new leaf. I have urged them to cast their lot with us the people of the United States of America, and to begin using their wealth and resources for the good of us all. Even at this late date, 
a sincere new beginning might enable their names to go down in history with honor instead of with a curse. But I must tell you now, my friends, that we have their answer. I have told you in the past about the role of the Rockefeller Empire in helping to finance the Bolshevik Revolution to take over Russia in 1917, and I have told you about the Rockefeller-Soviet alliance that grew out of that, and since the spring of 1976 I have been chronicling for you the collapse of this alliance in mutual double-cross. What an earlier Rockefeller generation spawned has gotten out of control of the third generation. But having learned nothing from this, the four Rockefeller brothers are now preparing to attempt a repeat performance, that is, a new Bolshevik revolution right here in the United States of America. Last month I let you in on the secret of understanding the Kremlin today. The Kremlin is now run not by the atheistic Communists known as Bolsheviks, but self-proclaimed spiritual Communists. Unlike the old Bolsheviks, who were always internationally minded and cooperated with the Rockefeller Empire, the spiritual Communists are strong nationalists who want Soviet Russia to rule the world. As the alliance between the Rockefellers and the Soviets has been disintegrating, so too has the internal alliance between the old Bolsheviks and spiritual Communists in Russia. More and more of the old Bolsheviks are being expelled from Russia only to be welcomed into the United States with open arms. And the key Federal regulatory agencies which govern Americans' lives and commerce are rapidly being packed with hundreds and hundreds of these arrivals from the Soviet Union. Just as outsiders sealed Russia's fate in 1917, the stage is being set here and now in the United States for a new Bolshevik Revolution. The old Bolsheviks flooding into our country from the Soviet Union are bitter enemies of the current regime in Russia. The positions of power and control which they once enjoyed there have been lost. The Rockefeller Brothers, too, are now the Kremlin's bitter enemies. So the alliance between them is a natural one, continuing in fact an alliance that used to link Washington and Moscow. The Rockefellers believe that the flood of Bolsheviks into our government is the fastest way they have of rooting out the large number of Soviet agents whom they placed in our government in the first place and who still take their orders from Moscow. But, my friends, this unholy alliance within our own land, while it is directed against Russia, is also directed against you and me. The freedom we love, our Constitution, our entire way of life is to be destroyed and replaced by the Bolshevik system of total control over our lives. My friends, this is hardly the kind of message that I enjoy recording just three days before celebrating the birth of our Lord Jesus the Christ. But it is He who said, You shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. And my Christmas wish for you and your loved ones is freedom, now and in the future. Without truth freedom is impossible, but it is easy to be free once you know the truth. Until next month, God willing, this is Dr. Beter. Thank you, and may God bless and protect each and every one of you.